Uh, I was born in this riding. I live in this riding. I made my living in this riding. I was a master always involved with what happens in our neighborhood. I've come forward this time because many of my neighbors, you included, have asked me to come forward and find out why we're having problems in this area, why the councillor is not representing us, why our problems are not being solved, why our tax dollars are not being spent properly. Uh, it's a very strong issue for me to see our neighborhood neighbors upset. I think uh, I want to come forward and help you, be there for you, and make sure that not only our arts are funded, our children are taken care of, and of course our city services are uh, looked at properly. And that's uh, basically where I stand with that, and I'm here basically for you and only you. I'm an independent, I do not belong to any party, I have financed my whole campaign wholly on my own. So, no tax dollars are spent for me. And thank you very much. I actually do not live in the riding, in the ward rather, I live at Sedina and Ward. I chose to run in this riding because I thought it was ward rather. I have lived here in the past and have lived all around the riding. Uh, the ward, I keep saying that. Um, I'm interested in running because there's a lot of little things cumulatively that added up. And I, I was, it was challenging to describe in one sentence why I was writing for myself. And then it <coughs> came to me. And it's really just right on my web page right here. To reduce the number of premature deaths in Toronto to zero. That could be through smog, through gun violence, through uh, a bicycle accident with a car. Uh, all of these, all of those little issues added up to, to life, really. Um, that's basically why I'm running. Why in this ward? Because this is the most challenging ward to run in the entire city. Uh, the incumbent who's been here for 26 years uh, has been able to touch upon issues citywide, pre-amalgamation and post-amalgamation. He is the deputy mayor. So any of the issues that I have, that hold dear to my heart, I was able to raise and run a positive campaign. I have not had much uh, attention, and this morning we had a, uh, an event at uh, George's uh, campaign headquarters, and it was called the Invisible Election. We had citywide candidates from Etobicoke, North York, uh, Scarborough, uh, some of them doubling uh, multiple candidates in the same ward, to draw attention that we have the greatest number of candidates running uh, in the history of Amalgamated City of Toronto. These are good people, but they have not gotten the attention. Uh, that they deserve. So, as an invisible candidate, uh, I uh, have done my best to raise the issues. And I'll just sum up with the uh, three <coughs> issues that are my platform is uh, a culture of sustainability. Trees, uh, one, one wind turbine, uh, solar roofs, uh, solar panels uh, are not enough. We need a culture of sustainability. A culture of civic engagement is what we demonstrated this morning. I hope to have, if elected, one co-counselor elected at a meeting such as this per neighborhood. We have seven self-identified neighborhoods in, in the ward, and these co-counselors will be able to meet three, four, or five thousand people, rather than the responsibility of one person addressing the needs of 55,000 people. Um, the last thing is what Pierre Di Di Giorgio, he's the poet laureate of Toronto, he says, Toronto is a city that has yet to fall in love with itself. So that is part, that is happiness. Happiness is a human right. Uh, please ask more about it uh, in our questions, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank uh, all of you for being here. Now, I'm running on my record, obviously. Uh, people say, well, you've been there for years. But I'd say I'd like the family doctor that you have to satisfy. So we are going to get rid of a good doctor when you know it's hard to get a good doctor in the first place. Now, I live in, in the area, I lived in this area for 41 years, I live in Beatrice Street. My kids are actually going to Austin and work in school together, and now my oldest is working in the Harvard Collegiate. So it's very much a uh, integral part of this community. Now, I have, uh, in the last uh, three years, had to focus on, uh, with Mayor Levin Miller, I'm the deputy mayor, as you pointed out, you know, the citywide issues as well as local issues. In terms of citywide issues, I've been chair of the city roundtable of the environment. And that's very, very important. The, the quality of life of all our city and urban area and community is very much affected by that. And as chair of the roundtable of the environment, and I see that Carol Sanders here was also a member of that roundtable, uh, we, which is a joint citizen and elected officials, by the way, it's about 15 members, 
few elected officials and the rest of our members of academia, the community, etc., etc. We brought 65 recommendations under what I like to consider my leadership with the full support of Mayor Miller to City Council. And City Council adopted 65 recommendations. And these are not the small recommendations, by the way. They, they range from making green roofs happen, you know, because 8% uh, of the surface are roofs that can be green. And if, you, if they were to be green, then what happens is summertime temperature in Toronto would be by anywhere by half a degree to two degrees centigrade. It's huge. You know, a change in mindset that uh, I mean, was talking about before. Now, also, if we put in a, a new uh, policy for the city, which is a green Toronto development standard, which means every new building in Toronto <coughs> should be a green building, from green roofs to energy conservation to water conservation to landscape and trees. Also, I continue to be the city's tree advocate, uh, and uh, in the last uh, seven years, we planted something like 400,000 additional trees and bushes. That the urban forest is the land of the city, you know, and, and I think it's essential that we do it. So we throw it back into focus. From the community, you know, every Saturday morning, I, I am for two hours, 9 to 11, just about every Saturday, sometimes you cannot do it, um, at the chin building in, in the atrium there. It's a whole lot of table, people got chairs, anybody can drop by without appointment. But I urge them to phone the office to make sure they're going to be there on Saturday. Because the people sometimes they want to go downtown to City Hall. So these are really, the, in terms of heritage, you know, I was very much the Princess Gates, so the work over there, including the bicycle lane, by the way, extending the bicycle lane on Harbor Street, which we pushed for just a few minutes ago. This is 2 minutes and 56 7 seconds, so I'll stop right now because I don't want to leave you to the uh, we formed two years ago uh, in response to the Dover Square development that was going up on uh, Dover Court and as part of that some of you may, might have um, remembered that we did a neighborhood survey to find out what kind of, um, if Section 37 money came out of that, what kind of improvements you would like to see in the community and the two top things that came up were um, Duffery Road Park and maintaining it, everybody loves it, and improving Moore Street. So um, I would like to ask the candidates what kind of concrete ideas you have for improving Bloor Street and helping us as local residents to come to Bloor Street for entertainment, for uh, shopping, for um, you know where where it is that we go rather than off to somewhere else. So um, let's take a look. Since we started that, end, we'll start to the response to this. Okay, try to stay within the minute and a half. Okay, the story of Moore Street is the story of uh, a lot of commercial strips. In, in other words, it used to be a wonderful street, then Dufferin Mall, the Dufferin Ray Club became a Dufferin Plaza, and then became the Dufferin Mall. And guess what? It led away, if you will, all the customers from Moore Street. And then Moore Street was been struggling to do so. Now, uh, in order to understand that, because it's important to understand the economic basis of, of an area. So, uh, however, Blue Street has to find its niche in fact. Yesterday I was knocking on, uh, talking to some business people from uh, Christmas Festival in Dover Court, uh, and it became clear to me that that is uh, actually that's the area in the world that I'm going to concentrate the most in the next uh, term, assuming I'm re-elected. I say that because it is the area that exhibits the most stress, if you will, you know, in terms of uh, being some criminal activities. Uh, you know, driving prostitution and so forth, and, and also because of the, the economic weakness which the commercial strip has. So the question is, how do you analyze it and how do you revitalize it? Okay? I mean, we began that process. I have a long history working with Brethren's Association in my work, and even the Dover, the, 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 the Dover Square Apartment, for example, which was a development, the local council there, that's the Sonoma area, as a conflict of interest, you know, because it's across the street from my area, I got involved to make sure that the residents' interest was being protected. So that, that's the, so I plan to work with residents, local business people, economic development in the city, and actually I have a student in my office who's uh, beginning to do some type of research. Um, I attended the World Urban Forum in Vancouver, uh, June 19th to 23rd. And Canada's biggest city did not have a single elected official present until day four. And that was Pam McConnell talking about specifically the uh, racism charter. Uh, at the World Urban Forum, I got many, many ideas specifically on this question, which is how do you revitalize a street that becomes a major thoroughfare uh, and it's just sort of assumed that's all it is. 
Um, what I would suggest is that we borrow an idea from British Columbia, and we have a charrette. They have uh, an organization called Smart Growth BC. We can have something called Smart Growth TO, Smart Growth Toronto. A charrette is where we bring all the stakeholders, all, all the people's ideas, and we explain everything. So if someone doesn't understand development, someone doesn't understand heritage, the heritage designation, someone doesn't understand uh, perhaps the points loyalty system of keeping people uh, their dollars longer in the neighborhood, uh, everybody gets on the same page with the maximum amount of knowledge. Then, when everybody knows as much knowledge as possible, the ideas will come from you, from me, from the neighborhood. I can just give off like 10, 20, 30 ideas right now, but those are my ideas and I can't give them that. Uh, so I propose having a charrette to proactively answer this question from the input of everyone. Thank you. Thanks about this. I did not come Blur Street. Uh, I helped renovate the, a place called Sardinia's Chicken Place and I put in a place called Blur Street Cafe. I noticed uh, there's been very little support in that area when it comes to crim criminal issues and cleaning up the area. I've talked to 14th Division. I want to have them there 24 hours to at least have some support, but I think we should begin by giving uh, at least tax incentives to the business to allow them to improve. Every improvement they make, they should get points, tax cuts. We should have times where the city actually promotes people to support the businesses in the area. They have the potential to do quite well. He, Joe has done it on College Street, but the ward consists of every different street in the area. Queen has done it. We can do it on Bloor Street by uh, supporting businesses, supporting activities up there, and making it safe first of all. There's quite a few homes in the area that are used as, uh, should I put it, crack houses, drug havens. We have to stop that. We have to proactively go in as a community and stop this drug uh, industry there, and then we can start building uh, the businesses there the way they should be. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. Uh, a very serious problem affecting this ward, which the city is ignoring. In Toronto, there are thousands of city blocks infested, and this ward is considered to be among the worst. At this time, the city has no plan in place, so they bought one in the past to help us deal with this problem. And e and but even though there are people who have near bankruptcy trying to protect their homes from this scourge. Right now, the only recourse we have in Canada to deal with this problem is to pump hundreds of gallons of chemicals into the ground around our houses, hoping to repel the insects. As any pest controller can tell you, this is far from foolproof. I personally know somebody who's had their house treated three times. I also know other house owners who have spent $120,000 on repairing their homes. On the other hand, in the US there are innumerable and far more effective options approved and in use. If you were elected a councillor, would you, one, push the city into taking responsibility for this problem, and two, help lobby the federal body responsible to allow us a method that actually works? What is your response, please? Okay, thank you. I'll start with Cindy and then we'll go to George and then John. So one, we'll try to limit it to one minute each, but we get a lot of questions through. Uh, thank you, Maggie, for your question. Um, I've had the fortune to live in a number of other cities, including Houston. Houston is close to New Orleans for Katarina Hit. Uh, the majority of houses built in New Orleans was made out of wood, and they had a incredible terminal problem. It literally, the majority of the, of the homes owned by everybody was infested with termites. Uh, had that, had the hurricane not come, uh, we would have actually seen the solution in action. New Orleans had a, uh, a proactive plan to deal with this emergency crisis, the entire economy, the housing uh, We should borrow from them, let our competitors pay our bills, and I say that, let the other states have done the work, as you raise uh, other cities in the United States. So uh, I'll say that uh, we don't have to, we cannot wait for the uh, federal government. We should have an aggressive interpretation of the legal powers that the city of Toronto has and answer that question now before next summer. Thank you. Okay, George. Technical problems are always a problem. I'm always uh, <coughs> looking for solutions that are environmentally safe because when we start putting pesticides into the ground to stop termites, it leads to other problems down the road. The city has to take responsibility, but of course, because of the way the city has been spending money, there's a shortage of funds to take care of serious problems like this. 
I'm the one who's been advocating to cut some major projects to fund things like termite, con termite control, actually going in there and using safe methods. Now that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, the, the companies that you're talking about in the United States, it is still an expensive process. I can't see uh, the city funding it completely 100% because uh, the homeowner has some responsibility as well. But we have to look at it carefully, either a share or a tax cut basis or some other way that we could come to an environmentally safe solution. But the only way to do it, we have to start. And <laughs> until we start, uh, there won't, won't be a solution, let's put it that way. Well, the subterranean uh, termite is an uh, immigrant from Florida, just from that. And I'm a, I don't know whether you're referring to me because, of, uh, because I used to live on Palmerston Avenue, so the college, and I've had termites three times, actually. They're, they're uh, difficult to deal with. So I, and by the way, it was paid by myself, and it was not paid by the city and anybody else. The problem that the city has is that 50% uh, of the taxes collected in the country go to the federal government. 42% of all taxes collected in the country go to provincial government. 8% go to the city. With the 8% we're supposed to be running transit and expanded. We're supposed to run police, we're supposed to run fire, ambulance, all the roads except for 41 and 427, that's always belong to us. You know, we're supposed to have libraries, which we do, you know, parks, and also a thousand good enough to have to pay 20% of uh, social assistance, child care, public housing. We don't have the money, you know, however, we have to encourage you more research. Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, two part question for each of the candidates. One is, do you know how many renters are in this ward or this riding? And two is, I recently heard about this um, move towards having landlords and licenses, and I'd really like to see that come through at City Hall so that we can get rid of bad landlords and blah, 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 blah. So what would you do to support and advocate on behalf of renters in your board? And the first part. Thank you. We'll start with George. That's an interesting question because we have uh, many tenants who are in what we call illegal apartments where people have bought homes, they've made basement apartments, they've rented them out, and uh, the problem is the tenants have no rights, the landlord has total control, and, and that's a very big problem. Uh, I would say at the moment, as, as I've been going around the ward, I'm looking at 30 to 40 percent of the ward could be renters, but it's very difficult to find the exact number. We look at the figures, they're showing me 40 percent, but landlords and tenants have to work within a guideline where both are protected. There are tenants who skip rent payments, and leave the landlord stuck with uh, uh, a big debt. We have landlords who basically uh, forget about the tenant and leave them in the cold. So I would like to have a proactive uh, bylaws and inspection of every uh, area where the tenants are renting and every landlord and to make sure that they have security as a landlord, to make sure that they are competent as a landlord and properly financed to take care of any problems that comes up between a ten tenant and landlord. Unfortunately, a lot of that also has to do with the province. So if we can uh, go after the province to bring in legislation, I'm all for it and uh, the city has to enforce that. Okay. Thank you. That's like 40 to 50 percent of, the, of uh, the households in, in, in the world, uh, I believe, are tenants. Uh, and uh, now the issue of uh, tenants' rights is a question of people rights. That's why, for example, whenever when the province, uh, in terms of the CBA, for the bug assessment, it, it's uh, machination to result in, in a decrease in apartment buildings, the city of Toronto passed and I supported the idea that we advise the tenants of a decrease in taxes when that occurs. I know most people get increased, including myself, but nevertheless, there's some of the apartment buildings that are decreased. And, and, and that's to make sure. We also have uh, the municipal housing standards to make sure that standards of accommodations are kept up. It's a bit of a stretch, a bit difficult, because you know, they can't get in, they can't be once, you basically have to be let in, otherwise, you have to get a, a court order to be let in if you want to run apart and find something that's wrong there in terms of that. I don't support uh, regulating landlords per se. Because again, I think that uh, the experience is that whenever you create bureaucracies, you know, uh, they simply cost a lot of money and don't necessarily get to where you want to go to. I'd rather the money be put in 
in, in a healthier infection system to make sure that people are living in appropriate accommodation, especially where there is a multi tenant situation. Um, at my table there at the back, I actually have a tenancy newsletter that's sitting there and I advise and request everyone who uh, wants more on this question to uh, pick that up. Um, I believe the quality of uh, or the, the kinds of tenants that are moving into this ward is changing the demographic of the ward. There's many students who can't afford to live east of Bathurst who are moving west of Bathurst. Um, uh, suburban flight has become a round trip where families uh, own a property down here. Uh, they live in the Steels, and uh, another family member is now coming back here, and they're renting other parts of uh, other parts of their house. So we're, we're in, the trend is definitely to increasing uh, uh, the residents would be tenants rather than uh, landlords or uh, homeowners. Um, I pretty much don't have anything else to say. I pay rent. I'm a tenant. Uh, I know what it's like. My parents have been landlords around, and I've seen the abuse both ways. People, uh, roommates don't pay rent, uh, and tenants get burned. Uh, landlords get burned. I've seen people not being able to make their mortgage payments. I've seen the exploitation. I can only suggest that uh, I'll bring my own personal experience, and this is everyone else's experience, as to uh, how difficult it is to balance uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not sure I've answered the question, though. <laughs> but you're the worry about the candidates. I'm wondering what the candidates have to say in respect uh, to the issue of homelessness. Uh, Queen Street West, there's a significant area where it's very visible in this ward. Uh, especially, I guess I'd like to throw this question to Mr. Sidon. Very good. Um, actually, here I have a blueprint in homelessness, and it's uh, pasted on my office window, campaign office, which is at 679 floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On page 6 of the summary, uh, there's a shocking insight that says $128 million of GPA uh, community housing, which is city owned, we manage 58,500 homes. And that means $116 million each year is returning municipal property taxes. So when we build affordable housing, the city is making money. Developers are making uh, money socially responsibly. It's a good thing to make housing for people. The more housing that we build, the better our society is, the better our neighborhoods are, the better Queen Street West, West Queen West will be. Um, so my answer is always to advocate for more affordable housing because everybody's a winner. Immediately, for the person on the street, that's not an answer. Uh, there is a program out there, uh, Homes First, Options for Homes, and other programs like that Let's get people off the street into uh, homes right away, and then deal with the other uh, uh, questions. Um, food, shelter, clothing, health care, happiness, these are human rights, and we should address that immediately. Thank you. George, do you to Well, I think it's interesting, you know, the fact that the city the city $65,000 a year for homeless persons to support them. Uh, I noticed Joe, there was a a report here about how they use that money to build homes and things like that. I don't understand why we have homeless, to tell you the truth, uh, when we have that kind of funding. Why uh, we can't hit some of this money directly to the people, give it to them directly, let them rent places and actually help them up off the street. Uh, if, uh, uh, met directly with many homeless, on, especially on Queen Street, and uh, they're puzzled by this, how they're sort of left out in the cold. Okay, they send them to the food bank, send them to the shelter. These aren't places that we can call home. Uh, we really have to solve the problem and, and directly uh, support the people so they can have a real home where they can rent, we can help with the food, and give them a, a hand up, a job, and so on, so they become a part of society. That's why I think they, they've uh, sort of uh, abandoned life uh, for now without that support, and I think we have to do it and uh, help help people out. Sorry. Now, everybody's finishing just around one minute, so you're doing well. So, <coughs> so, in 1993, the federal and provincial government stopped building affordable housing. Okay, and it took us uh, a long time to convince them again to start putting some money into it. Yes, we have 58,000 plus uh, housing. We are the biggest landlord in the country, actually. In that point. But I think the way that it is almost equivalent to that, because it's that bad. Now, the issue of homelessness is very important. Uh, the, there's this program that the city has in their real estate, 
which are fully support, which is from street to homes, which uh, basically goes through people who are actually in the street, and they're on the streets for a number of reasons. Could be, you know, health, mental health reasons, could be, you know, because they're escaping a home environment which is not very nice, or it could be all sorts of reasons. So part of the program is really to give them the highest priority possible. Because if you're on the street, sleep day after day, obviously, you know, it, it's the most imminent. And it's something like over 800 uh, people in the last uh, couple of years have been successfully done that. And that's what we need to do more of, frankly. And, but again, it goes back to money, and we, we, we have to expand the program. Because it becomes a lifestyle. And it's not a lifestyle that people there want to live, by the way. Nobody wants to be in that situation. So that's uh, how I think we should be continuing to address. That's sixty five thousand dollars mentioned by the way. It's a federal program, yes, which is ending in the spring. We're hoping that we'll succeed. More front of heating. We use uh, furnaces to heat our homes right now. To use the ground as a heat source is something new. It's something that's used in Europe and other countries. It's not being exploited in our city to any real degree. Maybe at the exhibition place they were starting to experiment with it. I don't think we should experiment with it.